few months ago, I issued a challenge to Krav Maga practitioners to prove that their system works. While Krav Maga is a hugely popular self-defense system, many of the videos online representing it demonstrate unrealistic techniques and a lack of understanding in many Krav Maga instructors of what really works for self-defense. My skepticism was further increased after I spoke with a former instructor who admitted that the Krav Maga schools he experienced we're not teaching self-defense that works. In order to see if my skepticism is justified, I issued my challenge asking for Krav Maga practitioners to send video contributions showing good examples of Krav, hoping to change my opinion. One thing is certain, I did not get a lack of contributions, but the question was, were these contributions good enough to prove that Krav Maga can actually work? Before we head into the contributions though, first of all, I want to take a look together with you at a bad example of Krav Maga, where the instructor fails to understand how realistic self-defense works and to explain how you can tell that the demonstrated technique wouldn't work against a fully committed resisting opponent. In this Krav Maga knife defense video, there are a number of things that are wrong. First of all, the attacker in this video is expected to attack only once from above, which is not how knife defense usually work. If you will take a look at real knife attacks, in most cases they tend to be rapid, repeated movements coming in from various directions. A person who intends to use a knife will also likely conceal the knife until the very last moment, instead of, as in this video, hold it in front of you, then use a big swing to attack. In this video, not only the attack is unrealistic, but so is the defense. Midway through the attack, the instructor uses a block reminding of a karate move. The problem with this block is that it creates no control of the knife-wielding arm or the attacker whatsoever, leaving the attacker free to continue to move around the arm and attack from other positions. Then, right after, the instructor grabs the arm with a single hand on the wrist and pushes the attacker's arm through. Once more, such a grab would not generate enough force to control the attacking arm and it would be easy for the knife-wielder to slip and continue to attack. Meanwhile, in knife defense systems that are based on reality, one of the main goals is to either create as much distance as possible or to move in close, doing your best to grab the knife wielding arm in a way which creates as much control as possible, preventing any further stabs or cuts, which is an approach that makes much more sense. Another crucial part that is unrealistic in this video is the training methodology. While static movements with compliant partners can be a valuable first step to learning a technique, there is still a long process ahead in learning and making sure a technique is viable under pressure. In a training methodology that is effective, the attacker does not stop under any conditions unless they are truly unable to move anymore, the same way a real attacker would act. Yet in this demonstration, when more intensity is added, the dynamics of the attack stay the same. The knife wielder attacks once, stops, and then waits for the practitioner to do their series of moves without any resistance. This type of training may create an illusion that you succeeded in applying the technique, but once someone really attacks you without stopping and offers resistance, things change dramatically. This result can be seen when someone decides to pressure test techniques that otherwise work only against a non-resisting, static, and compliant attacker. The same flaws can also be seen in other Krav Maga demonstrations where the attacker does the same. The attack stop and wait for the other person to perform a series of moves, yet again creating an unrealistic expectation in the defender that this series of moves will work, while in reality the practitioner does not develop the necessary skills to deal with real, spontaneous pressure and resistance, which is a different skill altogether. One of the main reasons why dealing with a resisting opponent is so different is because our brain and body work differently under stress compared to a static and safe environment. When we are safe and receive no resistance, our brain can perform all sorts of complicated movements by performing complex motor skills. Yet as soon as real resistance is applied, not only does the physical application change dramatically, but so do the inner workings of our brain. In stressful, life-threatening situations, our body goes into survival mode, releasing tons of adrenaline. Our brain and body then shift to a different state, under which complex motor skills that someone is used to doing against a non-resisting opponent become inaccessible. Instead, under stress, the body and brain mostly rely on gross motor skills. An example of this can be seen even with professional fighters, who are great in the cage. But once a brawl starts in the pre-fight conference, filled with adrenaline, they end up throwing wild punches like everyone else. Or when a kung fu master who practiced beautiful forms for decades goes to fight an MMA fighter 
and none of these movements come up. Unfortunately, most of the Krav Maga videos you can see online demonstrate complex techniques which consists a whole series of moves against a non-resisting opponent. This is why I'll admit, as I started looking at the video contributions, I was somewhat skeptical and my skepticism wasn't removed at first. While I received some videos of training under pressure, which is a great step forward, the footage that I examined first looked like regular kickboxing, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, or wrestling sparring. On one hand, I want to praise these practitioners for sparring and adding pressure. But on the other hand, the question comes up. If Krav Maga training ends up looking like regular kickboxing or BGJ, what is the use of all the complicated techniques that are taught otherwise? This also represents a phenomena that coach Matt Thornton describes as there is no Canadian geometry, meaning that if something works, it works, leaving no need to separate that functional practice by calling it something else or inventing new complicated moves. Meanwhile, for example, Traditional martial arts feature endless complicated and stylistic forms, yet when these same people begin to spar, their stand-up sparring ends up looking like kickboxing or Muay Thai, and their grappling like BJJ or wrestling. The same problem looking at these videos seems to exist in Krav Maga, when one thing is taught, but once pressure hits, the practitioner falls back into other pressure-tested practices, begging to ask the question, why is then Krav Maga worth learning altogether? Yet, as I continued to look at other contributions, a series of videos surprised me and made me rethink my position. One of my contributors sent a series of videos of Itai Jill, a Krav Maga instructor. As I watched his first video, I was skeptical. He was teaching knife defense in a, at first glance, similar way as in our first analyzed video. The attacker offered no resistance and a karate block was used. But then I heard this. When he's stabbing me from above and I just put my hand, how many of you think this is good enough and will stop the blade from going inside? This piqued my curiosity and I continued to listen. I then realized that Itai was offering a different, more direct approach, in which he was entering strong and trapped the arm in a much more efficient way. Nonetheless, I was still suspicious about this block, but then as I continued to watch Itai's other videos, I saw footage of him teaching knife defense against full-on resistance and pressure, where the attacker was stabbing from above and the defenders were able to apply the technique that Itai demonstrated earlier. The same contributor also sent me a video of a man being attacked with a baseball bat, where essentially the same technique was applied, further removing my doubts about Itai's demonstrated method. To make things even better, as I continued to watch Itai's videos, his seminars also included scenario-based training, something usually missing from combat sports and martial arts, where both the attacker and the defender imitated a real-life scenario with a realistic environment and unpredictable moment of attack. This type of training completely changes the dynamics of the technical application, as there is no squaring off as in sparring, and an element of surprise and a natural environment is added, something much more akin to real-life self-defense situations, this way helping the practitioner prepare for realistic situations much better. Itai was also teaching classes featuring full-contact fighting with armor in order to prepare the practitioners for the shock and intensity of a real fight, which is another great approach to learning effective self-defense. Needless to say, I was impressed with Itai's approach, but then my question was, does this type of training exist in other Krav Maga schools or is it unique to Itai's organization? Luckily, as I watched the other contributions, I witnessed more Krav Maga schools doing scenario training and pressure testing, which, I will be honest, changed my opinion of what Krav Maga can actually be. Yet the question still remains, are these schools that I saw examples of are the majority or the exception? And unfortunately, I tend to believe that the latter is true. In a video of a Krav Maga tournament where resistance and pressure is added, Itai says, I always believe that we need to have changes in self-defense slash hand-to-hand -hand combat, can you perform and do it under stress? The technical ability, you can learn it, but once there are stressors from outside, the mind is not trained to perform under stress. It requires specialized training, and that's what I'm trying to bring into the Krav world. Listening to his words, it becomes clear that the majority of Krav Maga schools lack training under resistance and pressure. This also becomes evident when looking at the majority of Krav Maga videos on YouTube, of which some have millions of views, yet demonstrate only non-resistance training and complicated series of moves that would not work under pressure. The same impression is received when listening to Krav Maga experts who became disillusioned with the practice. This one positive results and we weren't really getting those so that's what made me explore like why initially it was kind of like well maybe we're not training it hard enough which is what most people would say but then I sort of looked a little bit deep and I was, I was about to go hang on a second you know maybe it's not us maybe it's that 
With Krav Maga, one of the issues is quality control of instructors. Money talks. It's not like a lot of arts where you need a real solid depth of understanding to become an instructor. The majority of the videos you see on YouTube is a fair assessment of what's mostly happening in Krav Maga? I think so, because we, we quite often get people that have trained in other schools come across. Just the feedback we get, quite often they don't stay because it's too intense. Or then you get the hardcore guys that are like, oh, we never did this stuff. The instructor would just say, do this, but we'd never test it. We'd never see if it would work. We'd have to just, probably like all arts, you know, take their word for it. I really of. think that it's almost too hard to find what I would call a good Krav Maga center out there. Honestly, I, I would tell them to find a good jiu-jitsu place. <laughs> so what is the conclusion here? Looking at the contributed videos, it is clear that Karmaga can work and it can also fill an important gap usually found in combat sports, where only one-on-one, -on -one, squared off, empty-handed sparring happens by adding in scenarios, weapons, and pressure testing with elements of unpredictability. Unfortunately, while some Karmaga schools exist which do that, there seem to be plenty of schools that don't and live in a fantasy that training against a non-resisting opponent and learning a complex series of moves is enough, leaving us at a place where if someone asks us if Karmaga works, we shouldn't jump into binary conclusions of saying yes or no, but instead judge each case and school individually carefully assessing if the examined school applies pressure testing, scenario training, situational awareness, and if it ticks off other self-defense elements, which really makes sense. If you want to learn why this instructor quit Karmaga, click here. Thank you for watching, and as always, I wish you to own your journey.